Well, welcome back to the class that's seated here with me. Those of you watching around the world by DVD, we're glad that everybody's here. And we welcome you to session 27, which will speak about the spiritual gift of encouragement. In our last session, we discussed the gift of intercession. And we talked about prayer warriors. We mentioned that these are people who pray in anguish, that they pray ongoing, they do not stop. And we mentioned that these are people who pray sometimes in anguish. They pray uh, on an ongoing basis. They set aside large blocks of time and they feel deeply the pain that people are experiencing of those with whom they're praying for. Well, as we turn to the spiritual gift of encouragement, we're going to turn to those gifts that are associated with the heart. And I would like to mention, this is not a biblical concept. Paul does use the body as an analogy for the, uh, the body of Christ, but he does not associate spiritual gifts with the body. I'm using this analogy simply because it makes us it easier for us to see how certain gifts serve the same sorts of functions within the body of Christ as organs and systems in our body would be associated with each other to make sure that we're healthy and strong. Well, I'd like to start by talking about one of my favorite Bible characters uh, in the New Testament, and that is Barnabas. If you would open your Bibles to Acts 9 and verse 26, we'll find out a little bit about Barnabas. He actually appears quite early in the story. And I'm going to mention that without us going there because it's, it's an important part of who Barnabas is. It tells us a little bit about his character. So in Acts chapter 4, it introduces Barnabas with just one sentence. And here's what it says. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we learn several things about Barnabas. Barnabas was not his name. His name was Joseph. So when he came to Jerusalem, the Christians there changed his name from Joseph to Barnabas. And why? Because he was such an encourager they wanted people to know he was like a son of encouragement. He was embodied the gift of encouragement. And we will use him throughout this story of the gift of encouragement to understand what it means. The other thing we learn about him is he was not from Jerusalem. He was from Cyprus, small island in the Mediterranean Ocean off of the uh, Greece. And that he came from a Levite family. He was from a family that on Cyprus, they were the priests in the church. Why didn't he continue when he came to Jerusalem? There was no need for him, and so he focused on his missionary journeys with the Apostle Paul. Then we go to uh, chapter 9 and down to verse 26. In fact, I think I'm going to start a little sooner, right at verse 19. It says, this is after Paul has accepted Christ. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus when he became a Christian. At once, he, meaning Paul, began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc? in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Je Jesus is the Christ. Try to imagine yourself being with the church in Damascus. And here is the man who just days before had been on his way to capture the Christians, arrest them, take them back to Jerusalem, and punish them, possibly even kill them. And now suddenly he's preaching that Jesus is the Christ. 
you know, I think I would be a little skeptical. I mean, here's the guy who was on the other side before, and now he's on our side? Like, you were playing on that team before, but now you're playing on our team? It would not make sense to me, and I'd be a little unsure. Now we go down uh, to the fact that they were willing to uh, kill Paul, and they learned of the plan, and they took Paul, and they made sure that he made an escape so that he was not killed. Go to verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles in Jerusalem. And he told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. When the church in Damascus was skeptical and they uh, sent Paul away, Barnabas took him to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he personally guaranteed on the basis of his reputation, this man is, in fact, a Christian. He put it all on the line. Here's what he basically said. You know me. You know I'm a Christian. You know that I believe that Jesus is the Christ. You have seen me work among you. Now I tell you, based on my reputation, this man Saul is a Christian. The one who used to come after us has seen Jesus and has turned to Christ and is now preaching Christ. That is an amazing thing to do, to put it all on the line, to say, I vouch for him, I guarantee he is who he says he is, and if he's not, it's my reputation that suffers, not his. This is Barnabas at his best. And this is the gift of encouragement at its best. It's coming alongside someone who otherwise might fall away from the faith and make sure that they don't leave, that they stay, that they are accepted. And imagine what would have happened if Paul had not been accepted by the church in Jerusalem. He would have wandered away and we would never have heard his name. We would never have all the epistles that he wrote in the New Testament. He would have been lost to history. This isn't the only time that uh, Barnabas vouched for Paul or made sure that he didn't wander. After Barnabas was uh, vouching for him and he preached germ, uh, to the people. Then it says that the church was strengthened throughout Jerusalem. Let's go to uh, another portion. Let's go to Acts chapter 11, verse 25, where Barnabas appears again. Barnabas is a thread that runs through the book of Acts. He appears now and again, but every time he appears, he is the son of encouragement. Here's another example of how he supports Paul. Down in verse 25, Paul, Saul has left. Paul, who was then called Saul, he left and he was gone for two years. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Barnabas went to Saul's hometown, Tarsus. Saul is hanging around. He's just there for two years. He's not ministering. He's not doing anything. I believe that what is happening is that God is working on his heart during that time and ensuring that he's growing in Christ. But it's Barnabas who goes and gets him and says, come with me, we've got work to do. And you are going to be my partner and we're going to go to Antioch and we're going to start working together and we'll be there for a long time. And notice how the pair is mentioned, Barnabas and Saul. 
Barnabas and Saul. Later, this change, when Paul's name changes, uh, Saul's changed to Paul, it's Paul and Barnabas. In the beginning, it was Barnabas and Paul. Then suddenly, later in the book of Acts, it becomes Paul and Barnabas. Do you get the humility that Barnabas had to be able to say, I was once the leader in this relationship, but things have changed. The one who was my, uh, I was mentoring has now become, through God's grace, the leader of our team. And that he was willing to step aside and have it be Paul and Barnabas. I'm not sure that there's many people in the church today who with such humility would step aside and recognize God's doing something special through Paul. And Paul has the gifts to be the leader of our team. I have the gift of encouragement. And my role has been to mentor Paul. But God has gifted him to be the leader. Once again, if he had not stepped aside, had he not gone to Tarsus, we would have none of the books that Paul wrote. None of them. Paul would have just drifted off into history. Once again, this is the gift of encouragement. Come next to someone who is in danger of wandering away from the faith and draw them back in and to counsel them, to walk alongside them, to get them involved again in ministry so that they don't leave, so that they continue to be used of God in the church. Let's take a look at this uh, gift of encouragement by going back to one of the passages that we've used over and over again, Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, there are a variety of gifts listed. And in fact, one of them is the gift of encouragement. So we'll begin with verse 6 and we'll read through verse 8 and along the way we'll stop when we get to encouragement. Paul writes to the Romans, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, that is helps, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. All right, there are two words used here. One is the gift and one is the act of using the gift. In verse 8, the gift is encouraging, encouragement. The act of actually using it is where he says, let him encourage. They're the same, they're linked, but slightly different. Let's go to the Greek and look at encouragement. The word encouragement in the Greek means parakaleho. Parakaleho, that's G3844 in strong. And then the word for the actual act of encouraging is very similar, but it is paraklaxis, again with the CH, paraklaxis, G3874. The literal meaning of encouragement is to call to one side. Think of what Barnabas did. Barnabas called Paul to his side. He went to Tarsus and he said, I'm calling you to my side as my partner. I want you to team up with me to minister in the church of Antioch. That is the picture of encouragement, literally meaning you call someone to your side to walk with you for a spell. It is a gift that is not used in public. It is not the gift of leadership. It is not the gift of prophecy or teaching. That's an upfront gift where people see them using their gift in public. This is one of the gifts that's used one on one. Me and the person who is in danger of wandering away from the faith. And they're sensitive to the fact that somebody is right on the edge, right on the edge. They could topple and kind of wander away or they could be brought back into the fold. They are like the good shepherd is, where he goes out and he looks for the lost sheep and brings them back. It's a similar kind of thing. And later we'll look at the difference between shepherding and encouraging. But it's the same kind of idea. But there is another component to the gift of encouragement. 
That is a very positive side. I come alongside you and I comfort, I strengthen, I instruct you, I encourage you. But you may, from time to time, have heard this gift called exhortation. It has both components. It's like a coin. There are two sides to the coin. One side is the positive side. I call you to my side and I walk with you and I support you and I comfort you and I'm there for you. But there is also the other side, which is the tough love side. It's the part that says, you have got to change. You have got to get with it. You have got to get your act together. It is the in your face, all right, now that I've walked with you, it's time to change your ways. And I exhort you in the name of Jesus to be able to come back and to be able to walk with him once again. The negative side is to challenge the person. You know, this is no different than the two sides of God. We love today to think of the God of love, the God who cares for us, the God of compassion, the God of mercy, the God who loves us more than we could ever know and imagine. And he is that God. But he is not just that God. Because otherwise, he would be like a grandfather who just lets you get away with everything. Oh, don't worry, it's okay. Come on back, I forgive you. You know, come sit on my knee, everything will be okay. What kind of God would that be? That wouldn't be a God that we would follow willingly or a God that we would really believe loves us. There needs to be the other side, the God of justice. He is the God of love, but he is the God of justice. He is the God who says, all right, enough's enough, stop sinning. Turn around, repent, head the other direction, start walking with me. So there are two sides to God, the God of love and the God of discipline. And the God of discipline sometimes has to play tough and rough with us and get in our face and say, all right, that's enough. Now, he doesn't do it. He does it through people with the gift of encouragement. And they have both sides. They have a heart of compassion. They have a heart of justice. And they don't start with the heart of justice. How kind, uh, what kind of uh, support would it be if you immediately got in their face and told them, all right, get your act together, get back here. Instead, the person's hurting. There's some reason that they've wandered away. You need to come alongside. You put your arm around him and say, I'm here for you. I'll walk with you. Let's talk about it. What's going on in your life? Hmm. Let's pray about that. And you spend time with the person. You build up a trust relationship to the point where you're able to say, knock it off. You know, I've been the good guy so far, but I want you to know, you know what you're doing is wrong and you need to come back to the fold. There's both sides to this gift. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. The definition that we're going to use is no better than the literal term of, in the Greek, to call to one side. To call to one side. But I'm going to add two words to that so that we recognize the two sides of the coin. To call to one side to one to cheer on. Yes, you are a treasure child of the Most High God. Remember that. God loves you. And then second, to confront and to tell them that's as far as we're going. You need to come back now. I've walked with you. You know I love you. And I say it because I love you. Let's get back. Let's walk with God. The purpose of the gift is uh, multifaceted. It has many parts. It is first to comfort. It is then to admonish. 
and it is even to implore, to beg, come back to the fold. And it is maybe epitomized in Philippians chapter 3 that where Paul says, forget what's behind and press on to what lies ahead. Whatever it was that brought the person to the point where they wanted to wander away, whatever the pain was, whatever the event that happened in their life that caused them such pain, Paul says in Philippians, forget what's behind, press on toward what lies ahead. And that's what the person with the gift of encouragement says. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, I, I get it. I would feel the same pain. But forget, forget it. Put it behind you and press on to the days that are ahead. You've known the goodness of the Lord. You've tasted his goodness. Taste it again. Now, this is clearly the role in the church, again, of caring for the church, of coming alongside people hurting, walking with them, and bringing them back into the fold. It's often associated with the gift mix of mercy, with the gift of shepherding, and then the support gifts of discernment and wisdom. We have talked in the past that certain gifts cluster together and support one another for more effective ministry. One of them is the lead gift. The others come alongside to support. And that's what's called your gift mix. I looked at the commentators. Chuck Smith says, the gift of encouragement is the encouraging of person to go ahead and do what they really need to do that God wants them to do. It is exhorting a believer to take action. It isn't just, um, gosh, I care about you. It is that and more. It's because I care about you, you got to take action. Carl Westerlin, another commentator, says, the gift of encouragement is an, an appeal to a person's uh, choice. It's a person to choose God's way. It is about choice. You have a choice. Yeah, you can keep going the way you're going. Your choice. Or your choice is you can turn around and head the other way. And I'm here for you, whatever. But you know and I know the choice is really only one. Turn around and go the other way. David Gusick, the last commentator we'll mention, he says, the gift of encouragement is encouraging people to put onto practice what they've been taught. In other words, you know the right way. Now put it into practice. The visual aid that I would like us to use with this gift is an outstretched hand. An outstretched hand. I'm here for you. Let me pull you up. You know, you're, you're really down in the dumps. Let me pull you up. All right? But it's also to instill confidence. The pat on the back. Things are going to be okay. It's to provide comfort. I'll care for you. It's all right. And it's also to direct people in the right way to go. So think of the outstretched hand that can be used in many ways. Let's look at Barnabas one more time and let's go to the book of Acts and let's go down to verse 36 where once again we see Barnabas appear. Sometime later Paul, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Well Barnabas wanted to take John also called Mark with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he, Mark, had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp dis disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of God. He went through Syria and Cecilia strengthening the churches. 
Why did Paul not want to take John Mark? Because on a previous mission uh, trip, at the second stop, the second place they had stopped, for some reason that scripture doesn't explain, John Mark left and went back home. He left him what is called in English, high and dry. You're on your own. I'm going home. And Paul says, I'm not doing that again. I'm not taking John Mark with me and have him two stops into it say, see ya, I'm going home. And who steps up to support John Mark? Barnabas, the son of encouragement who says, I'm going to give him a second chance. Aren't you glad that we have a God who gives us a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance? Barnabas came alongside and said, yeah, he messed up. He went home. But I see good things in this man, and I want him to have another chance to show it. There's an interesting thing with commentators where they believe that in the book of Mark, the author talks about, or at the arrest of Jesus, there was a man who was so afraid that he literally ran out of his clothes naked to get away. And they believe that was John Mark. That it was his way of saying, there was a man. It's like when we go, I know somebody who, and what you really mean is I'm talking about me, but I'm making it someone else. You see, there was a pattern in John Mark's life of when the going gets tough, I get running. All right, if I don't like what's going on, I'm out of here. And he did that not only when Jesus was arrested, he did it in this case too. I have a, a personal example of my wife, whose name was Marsha. I've talked about her often. And I refer to people I know personally, because I'm giving you a personal example. There is nobody I have ever met who more exemplified the gift of encouragement than my wife, Marsha. She had a particular passion to help college-age students who were in that time of life where they were starting to say, do I believe what my parents believe because they're my parents? Or do I believe this because I believe it? Hmm, I'm not sure. And she would come alongside them and encourage them that, you know it's the truth. Jesus really does love you. You've heard this. Yeah, your parents believe it. But don't you believe it too? Look at all of life that you have ahead of you. God can use you in powerful ways. I would come home late at night from meetings at my school, and there would be Marsha with a group of young people laughing and talking and letting them know God loves you and cares about you and I'm there for you. And then she went a step beyond. Every college student loves it when somebody sends goodies to you. You know, like it's final exams and somebody sends you a package with cookies and candy and other things so that you have plenty of nourishment while you're studying. She would do that as a way of showing them in a tangible way, I love you and so does God. She was a model for the gift of encouragement. So once again, I have some questions for you. Ask them of yourselves. See if any of them apply. If at least one of them does apply, consider the fact you might have the gift of encouragement. So has God worked through you to come alongside a believer who's struggling and urge them not to give up? Has God worked through your life to urge people to come back to the Lord and then help them come back? And three, has God worked through your life to show God's love to others by listening to them when they're hurting, by showing them in tangible ways like emails, and letters and gifts that you care about them. If any of those are true, perhaps you have the gift of encouragement. 
a wonderful gift that has kept many from wandering away from the path. Well, we're glad that you joined us and we ask that you join us next time when we'll continue looking at gifts associated with the heart and this time the gift of hospitality. Thanks.